Hello and welcome to Story Mode, episode 17. Man, that number just keeps getting bigger and it's starting to scare me. How's everybody doing today? Just You're pretty good. Table. Just quiet, silence, perfect, yeah. excellent. Um, <laughs> so it's the library as always. Uh, well, anyways, my name's Greg, I'm your host today. Uh, and uh, this is a full spoiler show if you've never watched an episode of Story Mode before. Essentially, if you haven't played What Remains of Eden Finch, and you don't want to get completely crushed with spoilers, tune out now, come back, I'll put it up on YouTube, we all fine. It's also going to be up on SoundCloud, um, you can also find the show through our Steam group and curator. Um, hopefully I have done everything correctly this time and nothing is broken. Um, but anyways. Ideally. Yeah. So, if you haven't watched the show before, we just sit down and talk about our experiences with a particular game that we played over the past month. Think of it like a book club. Um... Yeah, it's just an open story discussion. So, uh, this month's episode is What Remains of Edith Finch by Giant Sparrow. And uh, sometimes we, we play games of middling quality, I would say. Sometimes we play very well-made projects, and sometimes we play games that are... Not. Brothers. Um, <laughs> that game was extremely well-made. Uh... I'll hurt you. <laughs> I... <laughs> Days without a brother's reference, zero. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that was reset yesterday, anyways. <laughs> anyway, um, glad I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, he hates brothers of tale of two sons because he's a horrible. Okay, Anyways, moving on. So, uh, t uh, I just want to introduce our uh, guest host real quick, which is uh, Mr. Uh, Doctor K Puffy. Say something about yourself and say hi. How are you doing? Hi, that's that's me. Uh, I'm a part time streamer. Some of you may know me. Uh, wanting to be more full time about it, but other than that, I like video games. So, hello. The man, the myth, the legend, and uh, our guest host Lewis. How are you doing today? Um, or good. good. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm Lewis, also known as LRF Lou. I uh, do stuff on the internet, and I'm terrible at these intros. Yay. Eh, we all have <laughs> like our weaknesses. And Eggman, how you doing today, sir? As always. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. My name's Jacob. I am a software developer, and I also enjoy video games. And without this podcast, uh, I wouldn't get a chance to play many uh, story-based games, and they're some of my favorites, so glad to be here that's what i love about this game it kind of forces me to play games that i just wouldn't normally like it's, we've played 17 or actually technically 18 games i guess on this show because we did one double well yeah we, we we've done a couple doubles so probably like 18 or 19 games at this point i've played for this show and um i probably wouldn't have played any of them <laughs> to be completely honest i probably would have played inside but i think everything else is just like would have gone right over the head so it's a uh, it's it's fun and i i like doing this show so anyways as I said, we play games of middling quality sometimes, but uh, this one stands out to me. There's a, a level of craft, craftsmanship in What Remains of Edith Finch that you don't see super often, and uh, it's a tragedy. So, that being said, Lewis, do you want to give us a little bit of a synopsis? Um, we'll... I can certainly try. Or at least, me... like, maybe the beginning premise? The... I guess the overall premise. So, like, this story has layers. It's like an onion that way. It has layers, and kind of the main layer is that it's about this family called the Finches. Um, it goes... You see back um, four generations-ish, and this this family is known for its fortune and misfortune. Uh, there's sort of this presumed curse on the family. Many of them die young and often die in very tragic ways. And so the main, uh, the main point of the story is to tell the stories of all these different finches, talk about how they died and what exactly happened. Um, the narrative structure for that is you follow Edith Finch, the youngest, uh, at the time of where most of the story takes place. Family. Yeah, and last remaining, going back through the old family house and trying to figure out what happened to all the family because uh, her mother really did not like talking about the past. Now, I just want, I want to talk about the house for a second. The house is, I guess, your playground. The house is big. It's uh, it's quite the expansive thing. The game runs, runs about 2 hours and 20 minutes, I think. Uh, or at least that's how long it took me. I felt like I was pretty 
like straightforward about how I played through. I dawdled in a few spots, but you could probably run this game in about two hours, I would assume. Um, but the house is pretty large, and it's it's very interesting because when each member of the family dies, instead of doing what you would normally do, which, you know, clear out all their stuff, move on with your life, they just sealed the doors. Well, to be fair, them, what like, they did was capsules. leave the rooms. They just left the rooms exactly how it was. It wasn't until after Milton disappeared, uh, of, you know, about kind of 10 years prior, 10, 12 years prior to when this was, was happening, 15. that the mother basically wanted to try to uh, keep the family out of the rooms and sealed up all the doors. She turns them into a museum of sorts. So Which is, well, sort of. She tried to seal up the doors and then... Uh, Edith's great grandmother, Edie, was in defiance of that, decided to draw peepholes in I, all, you know, drill peepholes in all the doors. I would describe it more as a time capsule. Yeah. Than a museum, kind of like just preserving the way they were, which is, you know, a real weird way to do it, but. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Dawn, it was really like her motivation behind this. And throughout most of the beginning of the game, I was like, is she just a crazy person? She's like sealing rooms and they're not used. And so they have all these like, separate rooms that are built on top of the house and it's very dawn is the like, main character's mother yeah, yeah. so yeah. she she was the one who made the decision to see all these rooms and it was ostensibly to protect edith from just this past this curse and the remaining and, family members i guess yeah, yeah. and later yeah. on edith has these thoughts of like are we just perpetuating this curse that we believe exists because it, things keep happening to us uh instead of just kind of like trying to ignore it and moving on with our lives. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know I keep like pushing towards like the design of this game, but I, I just need to make this clear. There is nothing in this game that's reused. Everything is designed completely uniquely for every single room. And it's not just a normal walking simulator, because every single time you go into one of the rooms, it switches to, I, I don't want to say WarioWare, but like it switches to almost its own little mini game. Um, that you need to play through, and they're all completely different, which I think is an extremely interesting take on a walking simulator, because I know some people get really bored of games with a lot of walking. I, I know that we had kind of had that issue with Virginia um, and mm -hmm. some, some other games that we've played in the past where it's just like, well, you know, I'm mostly just walking. Like, I'm not really doing anything. This game, you feel like you're participating, even though it's minimal in a lot of cases, like, you know, I'm just steering a thing around a thing while I'm getting narration, or I'm moving this here, or I'm playing a little mini game where I'm bouncing a frog out of a bathtub. You, you know, like, regardless of what you're doing, you're always interacting with the world in some way, unless you're just traveling to the next object. And traveling from room to room, I always found kind of like a marvel. Because it's like, there's always like a little highlighted object, you walk up to it and you interact with it. But the way you move through the house is amazing. There's one spot that really stuck in my mind, where you walk up to a bookshelf, you, yeah. and there's a book on the bookshelf, and there's a lock there, you put the key into the lock, you open it, you open the book up, and in the middle of the book there's a lever, you pull the lever out, push the lever down, and then push the bookshelf up and over and it like rolls up. And, like a garage door. Oh, I think I know which one you're talking about. It, it sounds almost like you're confusing a few because that one, I don't think it had a lock, but what it was is it had a book and then a slightly smaller book next to it and a smaller book and a yeah, smaller you book. Push you have in. to push them all into each other. It was, it was a camera, handle. actually. I just realized this as you were talking about it, but it was a camera because Sam, uh, yeah, Sam, the guy who was yeah. uh, one of the two halves of the room that that door was in, yeah. had a, an interest in photography. And so it was a camera oh, yeah. that you just, like an old camera. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. But and, and it's not like books weren't a theme to it. One of the first, like, because as uh, Blind mentioned, all the bedrooms got sealed up years before you come back to it. And so you basically have to find all these hidden passages. So like the first one is a book with a lock on it that when you open up the book, there's a handle to open it up. Um, the, probably one of my favorites is... Uh, in a bathroom, there's a book that says, like, you know, the secrets in the bathroom, and you open it up, and it's like, you know, there's a secret in this bathroom, and it's all like a pop-up book, and it's like, you know, it's that not, a, cool. it's not in the, yeah, it's not in the cupboard, it's in this book, and you pull a tab, and there's a little lock that you have to undo. It actually, the fact that somebody that made that was the funny part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I have to think about like, 
what the developers were thinking about while they were making this game. Like, what is something completely unique and interesting with a whole bunch of custom animation that we can do in this one spot? Yeah. Yeah, let's... Blaine, you're talking about the details. I just wanted to to run through some of the ones that really stood out to me. Go ahead. Like, just like the tiny details that you won't get in a AAA game most of the time. And it, this is just a small indie game, so, like... In the garage, we have the hangers, and they list off the names of who they belong to. Edie, Don, Lewis, Milton. Every book is different in every place. Like, there's some that have the same title, but the, even the models are different. We have the ship's wheel hanging above the island in the kitchen that holds all the pots and pans. There's a public market picture on the wall, which is a very famous place in downtown Seattle. We have a saw with a painting of Mount Rainier hanging over one of the windows in the living room. It's just like, who whose idea was it to come up with all this stuff? Who would think of, I, I, I don't know, like maybe these are more common things as decorations, there, like a there saw are books painting. There but... everywhere, and there are no copies of the books. All of the books mm -hmm. are different. Um, and I, I found uh, uh, Oliver Twist. You checked that. I found an of, of one room where there's two different versions, like different versions of Oliver Twist. So there's um, in uh, Barbara's in Barbara's room, uh, the movie star, on her bookshelf there are two different versions of Oliver Twist, and I went on a goddamn mission to find more. Cause I initially thought I'm like, man, that's got to be like an error, like that. There's two copies of Oliver Twist on that same bookshelf, and I went around just like staring at all i couldn't find another oliver twist everything else was different so it's uh it's kind of amazing actually it's not like they just here's our book wall texture it's these are all different and the texture work is extremely high quality if there is a piece of paper on the wall you can probably read it in most cases there were some that were a little bit tough but yeah, yeah. like the important ones were all readable yeah even some stuff that wasn't important, you know, like uh, just random things on the walls, like open book on the floor. There's a few spots where you can just like look down and be like, oh, <laughs> that's a readable page. So yeah. uh, this will become clear as we continue talking, but I had very little to complain about with this game. But there's a point at which you go downstairs and I was looking at the window and I noticed that there was a hook just floating in the air above the window. I'm like, ha! Look, they made a mistake. They are fallible. <laughs> They're people. <laughs> but yeah, like this game, the the detail work is is actually incredible. Yeah, I actually wanted to point out uh, another kind of bit of detail that was part of the narrative. Um, so we haven't really covered how we look at each character's story, you know, each family member's story, but it's always through. Um, there's always like a memoriam uh, for each character, and at each one, there's something unique with the writing on it. And it's different for each character. Molly has a diary. Barbara has a comic book. Um, I mean, what else? Uh, Gus has a poem strung up on a kite string. That was... Um, a... Yeah, the yeah, mission was distressing. <clears throat> Milton had a flip book. Like, it was all different. They all correlated with the character it was. And they all create a different framework around each of their stories. Did Walter just have the can opener? Uh, Walter Was had there? kind of a journal entry. He had a journal entry? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I actually managed to miss one. You yeah. can do that? Uh, I, I, I think all actually... of them are skippable, but most people wouldn't want to skip any of them. Yeah, I yeah. missed like that, them. That's, that's the main meat of the story. Then it gives um, you the replay story option at the very end, and then I just went back to it. I was like, "Oh crap, we missed one," and then we went and did it, and I was like, "Oh, okay, this makes sense." I don't. Yeah, I, don't I know mean, if... basically, you have to walk by all of them. I don't know if any way you can skip walking by each of the ones, but you don't have to interact with any of them. I believe Walters was just at a weird angle, and this is my only issue with the game. The FOV is extremely narrow. Um, so I played this entire game with mild motion sickness. <laughs> what did you um, think about Calvin's death scene? The swing. I oh, actually, that must have been. <laughs> I was watching actually, Blind play so that on stream, and I was feeling nauseous. And I don't really get nauseous from that. 
when I played it my first time, I got I had issues with it, but the second time I really didn't. I'm not sure why. By that point, Eggman, I shrunk the uh, resolution down to 1600 by 900 and played it in a window, and that fixed it. Because it gives the okay. illusion of sitting further back, which fixes the problem. But, you know, the game is gorgeous, so I want to look at it in the full resolution, but it's got, like, a FOV of, like, 65, 70. Like, it's, it's narrow. Like, it's as bad as Virginia was, and Virginia made me want to vomit. The difference is this game, like, at least it's full screen. Um, whereas, for those of you who played Virginia, that game had letterboxing, so that made it even worse. But at least yeah. it was, you know, full screen, so I can just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I got motion sick during that part, too. Um, but, you know, for a kid who whose dream is to go to space, it kind of makes sense in a way, right? Because not everybody's cut out to go to space because there's a lot of uh, intense training that you have to do, which is not going to go well for you if you have... Uh, motion sickness of of any degree really so yeah but i think that it would have helped if they'd even just increased the fov for that one section fair enough i i just you know if the game had like 10 more fov i would be fine you know like you don't have to go super wide for me with a game but if you're if you have a game with a lot of detail that moves at all in first person and the fov and the fov is under 80 it's the only real fault that i can find with the game um, aside from one spot where the game was just like, yeah, I'm going to like cut your frame rate down to like two, but I think that might've been just my computer being stupid. So, um, in general, I, don't I, any. I, I think the game was completely like flawless, more or less like this, this game deserves an FOV slider. Yeah. I want to be able to see the game better, essentially. Yeah. Like I played through it. I didn't like, go oh, screw this because I couldn't see what I was doing. So. I was actually kind of surprised, like, you keep saying how good it looked, and I thought, like, what was there was good, but, like, I had the settings all the way up on Ultra and, like, and like fully maxed out the game, and I thought it was kind of, like, kind of crap looking at places, like, low res textures, like, there was very bad aliasing I think on the, a lot of things. There was places where it's, like, no, I, I, I'm not saying I disagree with you, but, um, okay. There are places in the game where yeah, it looks a little muddy. I think the intro sequence when you're walking in, there are places where like the outside of the house will look a little, meh, and there there are spots where things will look a little like almost like they were smeared with Vaseline in a way. Um, but it it lended to a certain aesthetic for the game, yeah, which I think helped yeah. with that like very eerie thing where it's like um in the old Star Trek shows they would put a really crappy blur effect whenever they would go to an attractive character so that they would have this like light haze about it and for most of the game i would say that it kind of looking not super crisp not blurry or crappy like not like that but i mean like there was a certain aesthetic to it and sometimes like when you got up close to certain things it looked bad but most of the time walking around it i thought it helped the very like not spooky but you know create that mm -hmm. like so you're Oppressive. saying that it's kind of trying to avoid the uncanny valley, basically. Like, they, they said that this is where we want to be. If we go higher than this, then it's going to take a lot of work and not be worth it. Yeah, I think so. And I think the FOV kind of loops back into that, where, like, it's probably supposed to be tight to help that experience. This game also launched as a PS Plus game, um, and it looks hmm. nigh on identical on the console. So there is that. <laughs> You just said something that I that made me just realize mm -hmm. there's like only one face you see throughout the entire thing, and that face is the Barbara's boyfriend, which is done in a cell shading, and he's wearing sunglasses the entire time. So oh, you yeah. also see grandmothers. Yeah, you see her face. Yeah, at the very uh, end. Do you? Yeah, it's at, not really close, but I mean, yeah, you see like the table. paintings and stuff of the people's faces on like the wood memorials, but when you're in you the car really driving away, of, I don't think she's on the porch. And you can look up and she's just like sitting with her. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, at the very end of the game. But that's also really far away. Um, they, they did an interesting job of avoiding the Uncanny Valley for the characters by basically avoiding actually making models of the characters. And making mirrors that didn't work. Yeah. Um, it's very dirty. Amazing. Yeah. So. Although you can see your own body, which is interesting because I, I looked down at the very beginning and spoilers because it's a spoiler show but you look down and stout's like okay. either she either she really fat or you're pregnant 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, no, okay. I, think, I think she's pregnant. It, that is a good point. Um, they're, they do technically see Sam and Don during Sam's backstory when they're going hunting. And they're taking all the pictures. Yeah. And so it's not, you know, explicitly true, but they do avoid a lot of oh, faces. Yeah. When you're taking photos, uh, Fox Tex pointed out in chat that you do see Don's face. When you're taking yeah, photos. You also see Sam's. That mission, by the way, I think was my least favorite one. Mostly <laughs> because I got stuck trying to take the pictures. Like, I took a picture of uh, Sam at one point, and he's like, find something better to take a picture of. I'm like... <laughs> Stop <Where>? wasting film! <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's probably my biggest complaint with the whole thing. Was I mean, it's not just that. It's not the just the photography one, where it's hard to tell where you're supposed to go, but there's also the kite one, where when they stuck the words next to the totem pole, it's actually... I found that really difficult to figure out where I was supposed to go. I was just playing Kite Katamari Damasi and having fun with that, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, I accidentally the, got that one. Yeah, I got the, my mistake, too. It was like, oh, that's the thing that happened. The, the game felt like it was missing direction in a couple of points, which is interesting because one of my favorite points about it is um, because everything in the game is you know spoken through a narrator, and the narrator's handwriting or writing appears in the world. And sometimes when those words disappear, they go in the direction you're supposed to go. For example, when you finish Walter's mission, the text appears kind of at the end of the room, but then as it disappears, it points you to the hatch, which makes it easier to figure out where to go. And other stuff like that. They um, but they had the a really good... Thing. Yeah, they have a lot of really good organic ways of indicating where you should go, but then sometimes it just fails to direct you at all. And that felt really weird and out of place. Especially for a story like game, storybook game. I, I feel like the um the mini games are kind of like intentionally just random because it, it makes you snap back in to thinking about what you're doing. Like I've played a number of walking simulators at this point and or FPX games or whatever they want to call themselves now. Um <laughs> FPX. First person experience, thanks GDC. Oh. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't mind it. I think it's fine, but, uh, walking okay. simulator, more people know the term. Um, anyways, uh, it's kind of like a roguelike roguelite situation. Um, but anyways, so I've played a number of these now and a lot of them get very samey and you zone out. And I kind of like that they're not like do this in the mini games because they're all simple enough that with like eight, 10 seconds of screwing around, you can kind of figure out what needs to happen. Um, I do agree that some of the mini games are a little messed up. Um, the first one um, with the the Mo I think her name's Molly, right? Molly. Yep. Yeah, Molly, uh, where she eats the poisonous berries and dies, um, and has the oh, yeah. monster and all that. Um, when you turn into a shark, I got that shark completely stuck on a tree, like Same. unable to move. Like, just <laughs> is this, I did did I break it? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> The flailing shark yeah. flying down the side of a mountain, though, hilarious. Totally <laughs> yeah. made up for getting stuck on a tree. <laughs> yeah. like, ah, and then a tree. playing an owl. Like, yeah. you, yeah. you didn't really realize this at the beginning. Like, at first I thought, like, oh, either this is a daydream of Molly's or there is something really weird happening with this curse and only the people who die figure it out. But you, f you kind of pick up that the younger the person is that dies, the more their imagination plays into it, um, with mm -hmm. the exception of maybe Lewis, because his whole thing was imagination. But Molly, for example, she turned into a cat and then an owl and then a shark, and she's eating all these things, and then she dies. And then also uh, Gregory, the small baby. <laughs> Sorry, we, we have Gregory here. But, yeah, uh, go on. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but he, he's a small child in the tub, and he's like, directing the little bath toys with his mind and then it, and then he activates the tub and drowns himself or something um, yeah. si since we're in this position let's just go through each family member and how they die do you want Can't, to do that uh before we do i want to make one last complaint while we're talking about general complaints Launch. which was the controls were really weird and oddly obtuse Oh, yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. I started on my uh, Xbox One controller, stopped like three minutes in, switched to keyboard and mouse because it was like, it, it didn't, I don't think it was supposed to be made with the controller, but blind, you just said it was supposed to be on the PlayStation. So I'm well, like, it, uh... it, it, it was, it launched as a PS Plus game. So a lot of people got this game for free. It is on PlayStation. 
I think it's on Xbox. Hang on. Right, let's uh, find out. It just it did not handle the controller well. Like, I, because I you had to like weird. open the gate, like you would push up on the mouse and then you'd have to walk through it with W well, and I'm, like on the controller. I mean, was... opening stuff was like hold down the trigger and then you open it with the stick. Yeah. Well, anyways, I wanted anyways, to just kind of say to give a very weird. quick overview. Face buttons, these four things do absolutely nothing. Pretty much every action is with the right trigger. The left trigger can zoom under a certain circumstance and then, of course, normally move and look. Except move and look sort of take different responsibilities in different contexts, and sometimes this also does move, and sometimes they both do move, but different things. And sometimes they do the same thing, but, like, you want to turn left with one and right with the other because otherwise you're going to move slowly. It's, it was such a really, really weird mix of controls um since 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 i looked it up uh ec- uh it's not on xbox it's on microsoft windows and uh ps4 and uh it's got like kind of 90s across the board it's got a 90 on metacritic which is really good actually pc gamer gave it 91 out of 100 because they're weird <laughs> and do that one out of 100 yeah. scale it was gone yeah nothing ever felt too unintuitive i mean except for using the triggers so I didn't really have too much complaints about that. The one weird complaint I had was everything felt very sluggish. I mean, the movement I can kind of understand in context, but like looking felt like it had a half second delay and it took a bit of getting used to. Are you wireless? Yeah. Hmm. But it, it wasn't so much a latency issue, like it wasn't responding quickly enough. It was more like they wanted to have the camera have fluid motion. The so game it felt slower. The, yeah. the game feels like it's designed to be played slowly. And it doesn't like moving the camera fast. Um, I think that's intentional. Like it, it has like a definite speed up and slow down. I kind of love that. Um, just as somebody who likes looking at things in games, like panning around slowly in like a cinematic way almost. And to me, that was just it was very fluid. I, 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 yeah. I do agree that the controls are like okay. How the hell do I open this door? Like I had this moment at the first door where it was like what. But once I kind of got around figuring out how the right trigger worked, because I, I did play through it on my Xbox One controller right here, which not wireless. I, I like wires because I'm a weirdo. Um, but I, I did play through it on my Xbox One controller, and it it I, I found it controlled just fine for the most part. But I, I guess that's kind of just a, an opinion thing at that point. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like I yeah. I, I mean, if the controls weren't a deal breaker for me, it was just something I noted as being really weird. But I, I, am I the only one that hated not being able to run? Like, there's a point where she tells you, she's like, oh, like, explicitly that she's pregnant. And then I'm like, that explains a little bit, I guess. But, like, there was a part where I'm going up to the front door, right? And you have a key. You don't know what it's for. But you try the front door, and it doesn't work. And on the way up, you have to pass a garage and a truck. And I think there's, like, a shed with it or something. And I'm like, oh, you know, what if there was something down there that this opened? So then I had to walk all the way down the driveway and get over there and search the area. Mm-hmm. And then I had to walk all the way back up. And it's like, it doesn't take forever to do it. But it, like, if you could like briskly walk there, it would have taken like a quarter of the time. And instead I'm like, like all the way there. And it's just kind of like. I think I had like one moment where I was like, I wish I could move a little faster. And that was just, I was in the graveyard. And that was because I wanted to walk all the way back and look at one of the first graves again. Mm-hmm. But in general, I think because the game is so tightly designed, like there's always something you should be looking at. There's always something that you should either be interacting with or about to interact with or text you should be staring at or something in the background you should be staring at. I think it's designed that at that speed intentionally because there is enough visually and enough visual storytelling going on to be able to just stare at your environment. And like in the house, I didn't have a problem with it. Like I thought it it all worked out well, but I seen like the outside, like I agree in the cemetery too. Like I wanted to go back for something and then it's like, well, do I really want to go back? Like I have to walk all the way there. Let me just make sure there's nothing over here before I go back. For me, at least there's a lot of dialogue pacing that happened because the movement speed's so slow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost the movement speed isn't a actual actually a movement speed the movement speed is tied to this the speed at which the text is moving it's it's like imagine um an art like a jrpg where the text box fills up at the speed that you can read or maybe a little bit slower that is the speed that you're moving no 
Yeah. I also hate that. I always mash A to hurry up the text. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I can read I faster than you can. You're just trying to speed Speak. up the dialogue box is the reality of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't ha I didn't have any problem with the walking speed, and especially after the character revealed that she was pregnant, because I didn't guess that at the beginning. I thought that you could just look down far enough to see your chest, I guess, and then you could see Yeah, I saw screen. boobs. I didn't see past the boobs. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. I mean, <laughs> but I, 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 I was actually like genuinely worried for her, because uh, she's, she's like, Oh yeah, now that I'm 22 weeks pregnant, I shouldn't be like climbing up things. And she's like standing on a branch, 15 <laughs> feet above the ground, and climbing yeah. up a leg. Like, what are when, you doing? When I was at that point in the game, I was like, oh my god, she's gonna fall, isn't she? I was just, I was just <laughs> expecting like traumatic crap to happen to that poor child <laughs> the entire yeah. time. Because she's like the, 17 and pregnant too. It's just like the oppressiveness of the world, especially with the constant death really lends the Ooh. atmosphere as long as we're i know we want to go in through purposes of or the causes of death for all the characters but as long as we're talking about um the outside of the house did anybody walk through the forest at the beginning i i took I didn't, instead I didn't of the, do the other path. entrance i'm gonna do that um okay so, so i, only I didn't did the take, forest. okay so i did the forest too and there's these flowers in there these purple flowers i mm. recognize those flowers but i couldn't remember what they're called and so i just like typed in purple bell flower into uh google and and lo and behold they are digitalis flowers or foxglove uh digitalis Fox is we have those a at home. Right. yeah digitalis is a chemical compound that is a heart stimulant and if you overdose on it your heart will stop and so they can cause you to die if you eat yeah, too no, many of them um when when i was very little actually that's kind of funny that you mentioned that um when i was very little in my old house where i grew up we had foxglove everywhere and it was always my mom saying don't touch that <laughs> but they're, I, they're pretty it place close to you right they're pretty it, yeah. yeah if you had the uh if you actually went and looked that up it was a really good bit of foreshadowing or if you just knew it off the top of your head which i, I didn't so but it, i recognized it and i wanted to look it up so all the botanists out there be like oh oh, oh. Yep. foreshadowing <laughs> yep yeah, one of the uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up is I mentioned that they all the kind of narration appears in the world as text, but the game will try to force the camera to look at the text, which can be a bit awkward if you're trying to look at something else at the same time because the game will just be like, "Nope, look at this." Or if you accidentally catch a tr uh, like a corner of the trigger box, it's like off in the corner of the screen. You're like, "Hey, what's up, buddy?" <laughs> you know, yeah. I, no, I had one where the character <laughs> I had the character basically turned around and she tried to look at it through her belly. That was a weird one. <laughs> 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 like split downwards? Yes. Yes, the point is straight downwards. So like that's standing downwards, like right in front of the text. Around the and you just said it went back up. Can uh, I point out something about Edith? We don't necessarily know she died during childbirth. We don't actually have exact dates for that one. I mean we know when she died, because we can look at her tombstone. So she died January eighteenth, twenty seventeen. But Which we don't the necessarily same know when she game. was looking through the house when she was, you know, 22 weeks pregnant. We don't really know when she gave birth. We just know that the timeline adds up that she would have died shortly thereafter, if not during the childbirth. Well, we we, we know the game plays. Uh, oh my gosh, we know the game takes place in 2017, don't we? Um, the overarching story, which happens. Well, yes, as Edith, I mean. Yeah, when you're as Edith, I think that actually happens in 2016. Oh, that might be it. Okay. But they don't really give an exact date, so they don't really say if it's early 2016 or not. But we know it happened shortly after Don died, which was about October in 2016. Uh, if you look at her uh, wrist strap during the hospital scene, it says, mm -hmm. like, October 10th. That That's the kind of detail I love in this game, too. Like, you can figure it out because there's all these context clues. Yeah. Like for an, another example of that is Dawn loosely practices Christ, Christian religion. Um, well, and her sketching has a cross on her necklace. Yeah, and it's... it was it wasn't made clear what flavor of Christianity, but you can go into her room and there's a mug on her desk which says something Lutheran Church. And oh, so okay. it, I thought you were gonna be like Jesus number one God. Or something. <laughs> like, oh. as, as somebody who was raised Lutheran, that would explain why it's loose. It's as, what? As someone who was raised Lutheran, that would explain why it's loose. But uh, okay. go on. <laughs> I, I just wanted to point that out. 
Is there any of these death scenes that anybody does anybody want to dive into? I just kind of want to go in order. I think would make yeah. Let's easiest. just go in order. Talk about all of them. Yeah. How we discover them, or just chronologically from death, or yeah, it doesn't I think matter. I have Let's them... go in discover order because I had that okay. numbered in my notes. Okay. I like Molly that. was first then, right? Molly was first. Yeah. So Molly... so I pro I protested eating anything. I walked around the whole room. I tried to get back into bed. I'm like, mm, I'm gonna be a good girl. I ain't dying tonight. Mm. <laughs> and then <laughs> so no, this would happen if you were if it was Doc. Yeah. Yeah, so Molly was sent to bed without food, and then there's kind of this fever dream or just nightmare dream type thing where she's, she's, she's hallucinating. She's yeah. on drug trips. She wakes up. Well, he, the, as to what is real and what's not, it's not always obvious. I'm pretty sure none of it's real. I'm pretty My sure she actually turned into a She actually shark. woke up. <laughs> went and ate the holly berries in her bedroom and died. tripped out because those things are poisonous everything else is a fever dream yeah that's what i think that's what it was maybe she, she did also down into a toothpaste but... she might have also ate the toothpaste well she ate the toothpaste but toothpaste is usually at least child's toothpaste is usually safe enough i don't know i think the trip i think the three human beings might mess you up too but that was the hallucination <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, eating two organic. rabbits and a seal. Yeah, that's not the best thing for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then it's like into a giant she literally plus monster. Yeah, she literally is like, oh, I wanted a bigger rabbit, and then I tried to eat it, and I was choking, and I couldn't eat it, and then I just turned into a shark. So I yeah. Eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. It, it's essentially it's 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 just like little kids' imagination exploding as she's poisoned in a bathroom. Yeah. And there, was there any Easter egg about the sailors that she kills on the boat? Because, like, if there was something about that at some point, then I think that would have been, like, the cherry on the cake. Like, oh, my God, it was real. There's an achievement for but... listening to the sailor's whole song, which oh, is, nice. uh, what do you do with a drunken sailor? I think uh, was the main either. verse. Were you just staring at achievements the entire time you played through, or did you do two playthroughs? <laughs> I did two playthroughs. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> uh... But it's it just, yeah, the whole story is kind of interesting because it, like, the narrative is she's still hungry. And so she keeps trying to get more food, and, and that involves turning into a whole bunch of animals. So this this was our first experience with one of these death scenes. What was your guys' thoughts at that point in the game? Like, what did you think about the curse or how everybody else was going to die? Like, what what was your thoughts? I thought she was hallucinating. Straight up. Like, I, I, I didn't suspend my disbelief at all during that. It was just a... Yeah, she's dead. <laughs> it's like, well, I see where this is going. And then she starts hallucinating. It's like, okay, well, this is clearly just her imagination just flying around because there's there's no way in hell a, a small child like, is turning into a cat and then turning into a an owl and then a shark and then a giant octopus tentacle, tentacle and, monster thing. Yeah. And yeah. the beast hiding under her bed being a metaphor for her impending death by poison. Yes. I would, like, creeping up, waiting for her. My my original thought was that like this is really trippy, right? So maybe the curse is real, and I I would not have been surprised at all to see something like is that, it? especially. I mean, is it real? That may <laughs> that may maybe we we can talk about that maybe after we get through all these. I think it's uh Barbara that's next, right? Uh, technically it's Odin. You talk about Odin next. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Odin, which is the great great grandfather of Edith. Oh, um, not of Thor? Different guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, uh, he basically, his family had, they said like 500 years of fortune and misfortune. And he's like, I need to get out of town. I'm going to take my boat and I'm going to tether my house to it and I'm going to go sailing. And the picture he went they sailing. For it. <laughs> and then his house sunk because, you know, houses do so well as boats. Have you ever seen that, uh, that TV show, uh, Massive Moves? It's on like History Channel at like two o'clock in the morning. It sounds it's... like a Canadian only show. No, yeah. it, no, it's not actually. I've looked it up. It's uh, it's <laughs> on one American channel, but essentially, it's it it's takes mostly in pl place in Alaska and some places in nor northern Canada, but it's just people like the co this company that picks up cabins and moves them before flooding, um, and like incoming bad weather. 
And uh, I was looking at that and I'm going, no, <laughs> no that's not going to work. And there, it's, it's amazing. There's times when I have to like cut the house in half. It's actually a pretty good show. But um, anyways, really, really bad, like reality bullshit. TV. Anyways, it's like House Hunters then. Sure. Except yeah. moving yeah. the house. <laughs> yeah. And so we see his story through a picture, a series of like circular picture slides. <laughs> like I have no idea what they're called. Oh, yeah. The master. Sure. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah, and so it just shows some pictures from that era, and it shows him. They're not even really pictures. They're more like slides, almost like drawings. They're just real but... low-res pictures, I think. They yeah, were supposed to be pictures, right? Oh, yeah. I okay. think so. It's hard to tell. I think they're just supposed yeah. to be really low-res photographs. I don't remember off the top of my head, but Maybe. I think they were. That's what I assumed. Yeah, and so he tried to take himself and his uh, do daughter, sons, Edie and... daughter and son-in-law, Sven, right? Yes, uh, because his newborn and wife had previously died. Yeah, and so they all tried to go, and then Sven and Edie got off on shore, and he died with the house. Yep. As it sank into the ocean. Rest in peace. Rip in pieces. So, um, that that's Odin and Molly. What, what do we have next here? Where did that link go that I had? Uh, next tree? is Calvin. Calvin. Uh, the I, boy. Uh, I want to go to the moon, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this A one twin. I thought was actually really nice. So Calvin was Sam's twin, um, and so Sam ends up actually writing a eulogetic poem for it. I don't know yeah. if that's a real word, but um, wait, wait. Calvin was the swinging scene, though. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sam wrote. Oh yeah, there was the there was there was the poem. Yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah, the yeah. goal of this mini game is no. You you I'm come into, a different you, one. you go into the room and then you pick up the poem and you read the poem and then it switches to the swing and then you're on the swing and then so anyways the, the way Calvin dies is um, he really wants to fly. And uh, yeah. one day he decided he was going to fly. And they have like this kind of precarious swing set next to a cliff. And he's doing, trying to do the loop-de-loop -loop on the swing set. And uh, he pulls off the loop-de-loop -loop once. And then, whee! Yeah, it, it's, it's part of the poem mentions that, um, you know, maybe if the wind hadn't picked up that day, indicated that the wind may have uh, caused him to go faster than he wanted to. Him. But then he went over the cliff into the water. And it's not like he just jumped off the swing and landed. Yeah. His. No, it, it didn't end well for him, by the way. But that whole thing was actually really interesting. Like, the main quote of that was Sam saying, um, you know, when Calvin said he'd do something and he put his mind to it, he would do it. Uh, you know, after Molly had died, he promised to be brave, and he was. Uh, he said he would die before he ate another mushroom, and he did. Uh, he said he, would, he was going to fly. And, yeah. Um, I noticed, and I don't know how true this was, because I didn't really notice it in towards the end, but I suppose as we continue to go through the characters, I should probably bring it up early. Um, each character kind of was teaching a lesson. And it mm -hmm. wasn't until I got to Lewis where I kind of felt like the lesson was more directed at me or people like me, that it really like hit me like that, that these are there's a moral specifically that each death is uh, trying to teach. And uh, Value your I, damn family. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a that's, I think, the overall, yeah, yeah. But like Calvin's was like what, like the the warning against like over determination, like uh, a bold headedness and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What would Molly be a warning? Because I, I agree um, with you, and I, I had that same like moment. Uh, uh don't eat holly berries. <laughs> I mean, like, I, it, kind of like a preventative, like, teaching thing for, like, kids where it's, like, you know, you gotta, like, you can't punish them with no dinner, right? Like, yeah. bad things could happen. But, like, also, like, oh, there was something else with Molly that was going on. Um, like, maybe the dangers of an overactive imagination or something. Or maybe that was Gregory's, just hammering it home. Yeah, but Greg Gregory yeah. was also. I would say that was Lewis's, honestly. There's a lot of shared motifs between all of them, mm -hmm. um, but they kind of are scattered throughout the different generations, which makes things more interesting. Although yeah. I'll say, out of all of the all of the family members, I think Lewis is the one I'd want to hang out with. 
Well, <laughs> he definitely seems to know how to have a good yeah. time. And he lets you win at video games. That's yeah. always a good sign. Yeah, he's bad at video games, and he's got a lot of weed. Anyways. Oh, yeah. We have a lot more than just weed. Oh, yeah, my yeah. goodness. So the stuff that was hanging around, I was like, oh, boy, that's not okay. <laughs> a lot of stuff in that room. Um, yeah. Anyways, moving on. Uh, Barbara. Barbara's next. Yeah. So Barbara is a was a child film star in uh monster films and it was it... my friend bigfoot yeah i i i really liked hers um her her little story uh just because of the way it was presented it was presented as a moving comic book that you play through and what i thought was fantastically interesting about that one is it it felt like i was playing i, I don't know if you ever played it um there's a game on the genesis um where you play in a comic book and i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head but essentially you you're jumping from square to square to square and basically it's like a little brawler beat em up thing the game itself's not very good but it felt like it was that aesthetic and i really liked it i i don't know even though like the fov got even worse in that spot i yeah i kind of liked it yeah they nailed the comic book aesthetic and like the the yellow text boxes with the that certain font that's always associated with comic books the comic book font <laughs> yes yeah i mean like the only real complaint I could have about that one was that it felt a bit jarring when it cut from obviously hand-drawn stills to obviously cel-shaded 3D models for the moving parts and the playable parts. It was a little bit jarring, but it was at least similar enough that I could say, okay, there's an aesthetic going on. So I don't think, I think it was just a filter over the uh, the game, right? Yeah, that's all it was. The cel-shading filter, yeah. yeah. Now, that story was interesting because essentially it's Barbara and her boyfriend and when she grew up, she wasn't able to continue her her career going um, mm -hmm. as a as a horror film star. Um, and it's implied that it's because she couldn't scream properly, like her scream went away or whatever. And the whole like premise of that death is it's her boyfriend trying to get her scream back. So he dresses up as a evil psychopath who's come to kill her or whatever and uh, basically does his best to scare her. And uh, this progresses and through him chasing her throughout the house, or at least we assume it's him chasing her throughout the house. And then at the very end, like she comes out and it's just all of the like fairy tale monsters that she was stars with. And she's like, oh my God, I'm, it's all of these monsters. I'm going to be a big star. And then they tear her apart. And it's like, yeah. so what the killed her? <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a really weird one. Um, they actually do a really interesting job of uh, setting up how it makes sense both in a realistic sense and how the narrative presented it. I think it's, 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 it's extremely interesting because Edith, your character, straight up states, out of all of the stories they wrote about Barbara's death, why did mom decide to choose... No, why did Edith? Or, or why did Edie? So why, why, why did Edie, why did Edie great grandmother? Edie choose to keep this one? It's like there was a lot of different publicity around her, I guess, murder. Um, yeah. Honestly, the, my... my theoretical conclusion is uh, her boyfriend went nuts and killed her yeah oh. i mean it's worth pointing out that the way the story is laid out is actually kind of interesting because you know it starts with um you know with her boyfriend and then they had this whole nice um that's what i'm looking for foreshadowing with the radio saying the same same story about this murderer that's on the on the loose but then the boyfriend basically goes down to the basement waits for her to come down, tries to scare her with a uh, werewolf mask. And then when she realizes it's him, kicks him out of the house. And then later, uh, she was babysitting Walter, and Walter calls out to her, and she finds a man with a hook for an arm and ends up kind of beating him senseless, much like he, he, she actually accidentally did to her boyfriend. And then it has the whole thing with chances the doorbell and then suddenly in our house is a whole bunch of movie monsters. Um, what I thought was actually really cute about that one um, is that they kind of phrased the ending as a happy ending because it's like, you know, she realized what kind of monster she was with and what was going to happen. She was going to be famous. And she gives a performance of her of the lifetime. You ever seen thing. Tales from the Crypt? Nope. Darn. Because that entire sequence is straight out of Tales from the Crypt. Just, like, look up a, a YouTube video of Tales of the Crypt after this is over and go, like, just 
or if you're listening to this in post, just pause this and go there. Just look up some YouTube clips of Tales, because that entire comic strip is like an homage to Tales from the Crypt. Tales yeah. from the Crypt was comic books, short novels, and a TV show. And uh, it's essentially they're just like these little vignette horror stories in a way. And that entire thing just felt like it was straight out of that. And I yeah. kind of loved that. Anyways, uh, so at the very end, after you read the comic, uh, Edie does say that she thinks that, or Edith says that she thought Edie kept that one. I keep getting those names backwards. That Edie kept that one because it was a happy ending. That of the retellings of her story, that was the only one with a really happy ending. I thought that was kind of an interesting touch. Um, she, it's, she gets her screen back. She gets what it was that made her famous in the first place. Yeah. So. And the fact that like the comic drew her as smiling when all the monsters were attacking her and everything. So how how do we think she died? The ear in the um, music player is what convinced me that the hook killer was actually out and about murdering, and that's what actually killed her. Because was didn't they actually find the ear in the music box? Like that wasn't in the comic; that was in real life. They found her ear. Uh, right or it's am I... hard to tell what was and wasn't part of the story and i think that's part of the point it's hard to tell what was just the narrative and what actually happened yeah that, that was one of the more obtuse ones um but my implications were that she did have her boyfriend's crutch the entire time her boyfriend did go missing that night and they did find her ear in the music box but that was basically the only real thing so that ending that could be real and it's hard to tell we don't really know whether it was the boyfriend that did it we don't really know you know i think exactly it implies happened. that the he, he was wrongfully accused with like one of the phrasing it's implied that he didn't actually do it but they they imply they only really say that because they the comic was stating that it was the monsters that killed her so they said yeah. the police mm -hmm. blamed it on the boyfriend okay and... i just realized something next is walter right yep Walter, on the wall of his bunker above his fake window, has a crutch on the wall. Did you guys notice that? <laughs> I did not notice that. I didn't make the connection until right now, but I was like, hmm, Walter has a crutch too. I wonder if he had like a problem. Oh. <laughs> Wait, let's check the timelines. Do you think Walter was dating Barbara? <laughs> Walter was hiding under the bed the whole time. Yeah, he Remember was... That? He was supposedly hiding under their bed, but he was the one who originally screamed and called for Barbara's help, mm -hmm. which is why it makes more sense now. Like, he could have taken it as a memento, like to remember her by. Yeah, because they that, they that very true. explicitly say that Barbara's death basically is what drove Walter to the underground bunker. Yeah, which and the ending of oh, we'll get to that. It's yeah. well, Walter's next, right? So yeah, it's interesting mm -hmm. because they say that. Well, Barbara's death drove him to the bunker, and we were talking about this before the podcast, but the timeline is a little bit strange then, because Walter says at the end, when he gets out of the bunker, that he's been there for 30 years, which puts him in there about 1985, which is about 15 years after Barbara died. So did he really cope with it for 15 years, and then all of a sudden decided that he needed to make a bunker? And The timeline is really out? vague, and it's not actually certain what, when he went down there. The he had to build the bunker. The There's implication was of, he was down there for a, very a while. Bunk bunker, very elaborate. Yeah. There's a right. lot going on in there. <laughs> like, yeah, mine. Right, are we done with Barbara? Can we start moving on to yep. Walter yep. then? Okay, so Walter seems is you see him on a couple of days throughout the years of it hitting noon, the room shaking, and him opening and eating a can of halved peaches. Now there's a calendar on the side which helps give you a good idea of the timeline. It's worth noting that the first time you see that calendar, it reads uh, November 14th, 1968, which would actually put him in there for almost 36 years. Actually, almost 37, I believe. Yeah, he would have the, been 17 at that point. It's much longer yeah. than that, though, isn't it? Because he died 2005, and if it... If the he first, died the day he left, right? Yeah, he died the day he yeah. left. So... If he was in there 1968, according to the first date we saw on the calendar, I didn't notice the calendar dates. Um, so that would mean that it's closer to 46 years. That's a good point. I may have done the math wrong. Well, I, I honestly thought at some point he had said he had been down there for 50 years, and you're saying 30, and I just assumed that you guys had, since you had notes, had that right. I remember I'm pretty sure that's right. I remember yeah. him saying 30, but 
he just, also could have been going crazy. We just agree a long time. Screen. Lost count. <laughs> His clock really... may have been incredibly slow. That's that's also <laughs> a possibility. Well, he had food the entire time, so maybe he had batteries. There's but also Edie an implication. Food. Yeah, that Edie was the one bringing him food pretty much the entire time. True. Yeah, like putting the food in the refrigerator and then... Yeah. It does say 30 years. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so he definitely is not... Or maybe his clock was fast, so he thought he was down there longer than he had. <laughs> but he was <laughs> marking off years the fast. years. <laughs> he was marking off the years accurately, so he must just have been estimating or something. I don't know. It's really weird... And it actually makes it hard to tell when he went underground. Mm-hmm. I don't. Um, I, it's interesting because of the discrepancies, but I don't think it's particularly important to the message that we get from this whole thing. Because the mini game, according with his death scene, has you opening these cans of halved peaches, and you just move your mouse in a circle and open them, and you just do this a few times, and then he's like, you're kind of getting his inner monologue is like, well, the the rumbling stopped, and now I guess. I need to get out of here and just have my just one one. I just need to get out of here, basically. Yeah, and then um, the rumbling did. He assumed it was the monster. Yeah. Um. Do you guys think actually, it was the train? Oh, it was definitely the train. It, it was, was the definitely train. the train, but I'm not sure he necessarily thought it was the monster. It's kind of implied. He mentions at one point, uh, anything would seem normal at this point, even a monster on the other side of the door. But that's the only real implication that he thinks it's a monster. But it's like a week after the rumbling stops is when he's like, well, clearly the threat's gone. So I yep. would kind of... He, uh, he stops hearing the rumbling on 24th of March and he leaves the uh, 31st of March. And he grabs a sledgehammer, goes over to the door by his garbage bin, essentially, where he was throwing all of the uh, cans and stuff. And, and possibly um, his poop. Or well, everything. Everything yeah. that he outputs, he puts there. Um, and he uh, bashes... There was a shower in the bunker. Was there? Oh. Yeah. If you turn around from where the uh, thing is and you head kind of back towards the direction you came, next to the uh, food supplies was a shower. And uh, anyways, so we um, <laughs> we, we go through that the, the, the bunker and then he bashes through the wall. He jumps through the hole that he makes in the wall, lands on the train tracks, starts to walk out, and then gets run over by a train. While admiring the beauty of nature surrounding him. Yep. He was awestruck. And then he was struck. He was awestruck. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good point. That shower has some uh, dishes on the dish rack in it as well. <laughs> so two birds with one stone. Just wash yeah, up here. Much. The... <laughs> well, yeah, right. Yeah. It's worth pointing out that what we see there is theoretically how Edith saw it or how Edith's son saw it because of the narrative structure that we don't necessarily know that he came out to sunlight and was immediately hit by a train. Those could have some variability to it. And he says something about like, oh, if I had one year or even one month or even one week, you would be happy. Yeah. I'd even be happy with one day. Hit by Does he actually get to saying one day? Like I was yes, expecting right before he's to. hit by the train. Okay. He says, I'd even be happy with one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't yeah. even get that far, but I mean, you know, if, if you're going to waste your life in a bunker, I mean, anyways. The lesson there being uh, don't be ruled by your fears. Yep. Uh-huh. Okay, so then after okay we, we let's see we got after Mom. walter we go outside and we eventually make our way to the top of the house with all the additions yeah. after and we get to, to sam's bedroom which by the way the architecture of this house i just none of it though just all of the additions that they made up on the, the top they're like let's just put some four by fours some glue and yeah and a boat. It's pretty much a boat. it's worth pointing <laughs> out that we're not, not actually okay. to the additions yet we go outside and go uh, into the third floor, into the yeah, attic this is area. Just the, this, this is just the original. I mean, they might have been building floors on the house, but this is just like, we're still like just in, in attics, right? Oh, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Because next is Sam's story, which is the one with the camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And he's, yeah, um, in the attic. Yep. Yeah, so in Sam's story, you go into his room and you notice that there's a lot of hunting equipment and his trophies. He was also very into the military. He was part of the military he has all these he medals was on he was a very bright. decorated yes. soldier very decorated yeah, so he's soldier. a marine uh and 
So his daughter was Dawn, who is the narrator's mother. And in his death scene that you see by looking through these pictures, you have to take photos of this You're hunting trip that he went on with Dawn. Uh, it's it's Dawn and Sam camping, and you switch back and forth between Dawn and Sam in different situations, taking photos of one another and various things in the environment. And they give you like a brief hint on what you're supposed to take a photo of, uh, just in a sentence like, oh, you know, maybe you'll spot a deer. And then you have to like pan around until you find a deer and take a picture of the deer. Um, I, I know that Except it, he never said take a picture of a deer. Oh wait, no, he yeah, did in the, the next one. It, it, I, 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 I know this yeah, is kind of confusing. This one frustrated Doc. Uh, he mentioned in the pre-show. Um, and uh, I, I do want to say that I think that his death scene was the most powerful. That, or at least for me, was very impacting because essentially what he does is they've he he got Sean or Sean Do, Sean sorry uh, Don <laughs> to shoot the deer um and she's like i don't want to do that and then you just see her and she's sitting by the deer and she's just like bawling and she's like it's still moving is this normal he goes yeah yeah that's it's to be expected and he sets the camera up on a timed photo walks around and they're like on the edge of a cliff walks around sits down holds up the antlers and it jerks its head and launches him off the cliff and takes a photo of him as he's like in midair yeah, like, it was one of the few ones that was a true surprise. Most of the others, you can kind of tell what was going to happen yeah. fairly early, but that one was one of the few real surprises. It was like, whoa. Oh, as soon as I saw the deer on the cliff, I'm like, oh, he's going over. Really? <laughs> like, as soon know. as I saw that cliff, I'm like, oh, because like the way that they do the cliff, it's like, it, it was really cinematic. Like there was the, obviously this huge drop off and then the little roundup to it. I'm like, they didn't render all that over on the side of the cliff for nothing. Like he's going down. <laughs> Also, just to clear something up in chat, you did not shoot. We did not shoot Bambi's mom in that scene. That that is clearly a buck. <laughs> so maybe Bambi's dad. Such horn. Whatever. Okay. Fine. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but um, I in his tale, I thought was like, no matter what you do in your life, you should never be like too comfortable. Like uh, coming off of Walters, where he like freaked out, went to the extreme of being super paranoid and making sure that nothing happens to him with the curse and then sam was on the opposite end he just threw caution to the wind doing all the risky things during the military when he knew that his family had a curse and then in a moment of not being careful he died yeah so yeah. <sighs> this is getting depressing okay uh, yep uh let's see so so that's sam and then who came so then after sam? sam you go over to the bedroom yeah. Which used to be Gus's, Gregory's, and Don's. Yeah, and that's Gregory that's next, right? Uh, if we go chronologically, yes, you can actually well, start with Gregory or Gus. So let's go with Gregory with. next. I started with Gregory. Let's get this over with. So, for those of you who don't know, my name's Gregory. So, this is like awkward. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, you so, were an adorable baby, by the way. Yeah. So, essentially, uh, like, for the record, <laughs> Gregory dies when he's 23 months old or a year and 11 months. He doesn't even turn two. Yeah, so this is the, the youngest death in the family. And um, essentially, he's in the bathtub in a bathroom that you're in earlier in the game, which is interesting. They mentioned the pink bathroom earlier on. Um, yeah. And it's... He's, he's in the bathtub, and he's just, like, playing with his bath toys. And then Mom comes in and drains the bathtub, and then he's playing with his bath toys, and... Manages it is worth to... noting though it's not just a normal tub it's a shower tub combo and yeah. they have the sliding glass doors that are built into the tub so when you know you'll get to that when it happens it's it, it won't just spill over i used to thing. have one of those in my old house and they they do spill over but like as a little kid who did dumb things in the bathtub when i was younger um i can confirm they do leak <laughs> quite they like, leak, yeah, but you, you yeah. can't really continue to fill a bathtub, anyways. Uh, Definitely bathtub. over a yeah. child's head, though. Oh yeah, no, like, I, absolutely. Like you, you could totally. Yeah. Um, uh oh, I think uh -oh. You, we lost you. Do you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh. Black screen. Uh, well, 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 well. Let's anyways, keep rolling. Let's keep so, rolling. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the bathtub just like fills up and then drowns him. Um. And the mini game is essentially you you have this little frog and you're like bouncing this frog around in the water and like launching him and pulling letters down from um, up on the wall and it's you know it's 
it's it's clearly in his imagination unless this baby has telekinetic powers which is unlikely um <laughs> i think he does i choose uh, to believe <laughs> yeah I, I almost i almost don't know like what the mission of this is and until doc gets his camera sorted i'm just going to do a thing so y you if you guys yeah. want to talk about this story somewhere you can I'm um go it's to Google worth images. noting the narrative structure for this each one i mentioned has kind of slightly different way that they tell the story and in this one the story is told as an extra note from sam to the recently ex-wife k as part of the divorce <laughs> filings so you pick up like a divorce the divorce paperwork and you flip the page and it's a note to k like um, the reason that they got a divorce or something it was like evidence a or exhibit a I don't even think that. that was it. No, it was more just a personal note that was part of it. Um, it they don't well, really they give do a that? timeline for how the divorce fit in with this, though they definitely indicate that it was a part that made it messier. Um, it, ah, they mm -hmm. sort of indicate that they were separate at that point because the entire story is Gregory's in the bath, and you know, right as you're about to uh, start, basically start it, um, the mother... Uh, Kay was kind of ready to drain the tub when she gets a phone call from Sam. And so she goes and answers that. And so then you're playing in the tub for a little bit longer. And then she finally hangs up the phone, unplugs the tub, you know, drains it, and gets another call from Sam. Uh, and in fact, Kay explicitly says, um, I don't want Gregory to hear this. And so she leaves the bathroom. And that's when Gregory happens to turn the water back on and drown himself. Um, he was not okay with the divorce, needless to say. Yeah. Right, whether or I, not he knew about it. Yeah. The, uh... I think that... I don't think he was suicidal. <laughs> There's another little bit of detail in there that I thought was really nice, because earlier in the game, you walk through Edie's bathroom, or you can, and mm -hmm. uh, it connects to this garish pink bathroom that looks disgusting and horrible that was yeah i'm not joking like when he says it. pink it's, i kind of like it like pink. Foot long shag carpet it's <laughs> what in a bathroom like what the heck yeah <laughs> so unsanitary gosh yeah yeah it's but like anyway covered in mold this this scene <laughs> takes place in that bathroom and mm. on the counter in that bathroom when you go through there's a little wind-up frog and it's the same wind-up frog that is a prop in this kid's imagination which i think is Another really good bit of detail that they added. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, same with the bubble bath. Uh, the the same soap yeah. is on the the counter in both scenes. Yeah. Oh my god, he's back! <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I don't know what happened. My webcam crashed, and then it switched sources to face rig. So after I had relaunched my webcam program, it still wasn't registering it because <laughs> it thought for some reason that I was trying to be very, a, a weird creature on face rig. Which I oh, I mean. I can always like replace you with various images, like uh, some reason. Cat, we can make you into a cat. Yeah, well, anyways, um, let's just cool. Okay, uh, it's then... live. Stuff stuff breaks. Next, I like stuff... how uh, Gregory's story ends. So as you get to the point where the water's going above the camera level, which is implied to be Gregory's eye level, because at the very beginning you're holding onto the frog and you're controlling the kid's arm and so it puts the pov right in his face and so when the water level gets above his head it switches to a whole scene where you're a frog swimming in the giant bathtub that and you're kind of swimming around because it yeah. was you're not a frog you're a baby with frog skin <laughs> yeah that was I guess. it was just really weird like but you're I also thought... the size of the frog toy you shrink down sure but you're also in the ocean um, like I don't, I yeah. don't know. That whole thing was weird. I mean, I get. We're well, also in the ocean because you have the seaweed and stuff, but you're also still in the bathtub because you have the letters that spelled out Gregory that were on the side of the bathtub, I mean, and you yeah. have all the toys and the big whale and you know, everything it's there. It's implying it, the baby's drowning. Yes, but <laughs> it's done in a thematically beautiful way. I, I think like one thing that I really need to applaud this game by is it is dark. Like, no. this, this entire no. game is, like, suicidally depressive, but somehow manages to make it, like, lighthearted and makes me think back on it like, in a, oh, that was a nice story. In reality, it's just, like, this is the it's worst macabre. tragedy in the entire world, and everybody's dead. It's like, <laughs> I, I, we looked it up. I, I wasn't sure, I, you know, 
My dad was saying it's macabre, but then we looked it up on the dictionary and it said macabre. So I don't know. I don't care. Is that what that word means? That's a big word. Yep. <laughs> Too many syllables for me. Yeah. Three syllables. Too many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next uh, next death scene we see is Gus's death scene. Uh, which is Gus... told through a poem written by Don, which is yes. Edith's mother. Wrapped around a kite spool, which is apparently the same one that he was flying during the death scene. During the scene, you have to, you're flying this kite and you're kind of like pissed off that uh, Don, or no, who is it? Uh, Sam. Sam is getting remarried. Uh, you're like, I'll die before I, and, and he says that I'll die before I see a wedding at this house. Yeah. Which again, turns out to be true. Um, sort of. He sees the wedding in a sense because he dies during the reception. Yeah, yeah. which is after so, the sermon. Yeah. He's flying his kite, and you have to collect the letters that are floating in the sky, and it forms this poem as you're going through it. This one was yeah. kind of beautiful, audio-wise. Yeah. I yeah, I found and like the visuals of it. You're essentially playing letter Katamar Damacy with a kite. <laughs> I I really liked this mini game, but yeah. it's it's one of the more gorgeous, like tragic scenes in the game. Yeah. yeah. So what starts happening is once everyone moves inside the tent for the reception, the weather starts picking up, and so to demonstrate that the kite as you start trying to pick up letters, we'll start picking up the chairs from the ceremony and pick up the banners and everything else it can, basically. Hmm. Even bigger and, stuff like tables. And yeah, like until videos. you're basically a kite followed by the entire reception stage, basically. Essentially, and, what, and then you pick up the uh, tent. What I think the game is trying to symbolize is you're outside flying a kite and the wind is getting too damn strong. Yeah, But what it looks like is Gus is a master of the elements, and he decides to kill his entire family. Yeah, pretty much. And then, then you crash your kite into the tent, and it goes, boof, and flies away. Turns and into a you. giant jellyfish. And goes, yeah. boop, boop, crushes boop, you. Boop. So, so It was cinematic. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm starting to notice a theme among the family members. They all have telekinetic powers. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and shape They're power. actually all Jedi. <laughs> now, there, we're just left with Edie... Oh. Dawn and Edith's generation, the narrator. Yeah. What was Gus's moral, though? Oh, and Lewis. She's that was in... part of Dawn's, yeah. you know, the yeah. e Edith's generation. Okay, true. Yeah. Yeah, Milton and Lewis. Yeah. Okay. So now. I would say that he is, um, for Gus's moral, he's just kind of being too. Um, I'm trying to think of a better word than audacious, just Def like. Defiant? defiant yeah like he's like wh when he's asked to like come take pictures with the family he he gives them the middle finger right yeah, yeah. And i so, mean in this picture he has like the spiked hair too so he's like the punk i mean yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah before so, i like that kid yeah before we go on <laughs> to the next one uh there was something that i thought was really hilarious on the board because sam was a very military person they had the duty board and like a timeline yeah. for every day yeah. and gregory's duties were be a baby yeah i love that one <laughs> i saw that too that that cracked me up it's like yeah. uh it, it was like um don uh mop do, do dishes and then um gus was like mow the grass tend to the garden sweep the floors and then gregory be a baby <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll have something for you soon child yeah He's going to uh, boss baby that. I wanted to point something out in that room because I noticed there are three light switches, each one labeled Don, Gus, and Gregory. And there's not lights over their bed. So what did those light switches go to? I, I had assumed that there were at some point because um, Don's is all, her bed's all packed up. So I'm assuming at some point they came in and maybe, did something. Yeah, had like individual little lamps. Yeah, or something. Maybe. Connected so to the outlets on the wall or something. If Gregory had a light switch, how the... Most flip it. <laughs> yeah. It was future proofing. Come on. I, okay. Just, Is this like they were prepared. HDMI cables in your walls? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Clearly, yep. you should use Ethernet cables because you can always just use, you know, video over Ethernet. <laughs> okay. I Our... think Milton is the next one, right? Well, it's worth talking about that this is the point where you leave the attic and you start getting to the additions. So, this is where they start doing makeshift stuff on the house. Mm hmm. 
Um, they build a classroom up on the roof too, which I was like, yeah, sure. Okay. I think the classroom happens after you get to Milton, but I noticed some interesting things about the classroom. Like, um, you know, some some of you already mentioned that Don was kind of religious, and they definitely had some references to that. But a lot of that classroom was very like the list of the scientific method and you know, like all the different species stuff. And there's in fact one poster made by Edith, which it looks like a science fair board talking about the curse of the family and talking about you know how it's like the history and the supposed curse and all that stuff yeah i saw that one um but I the other thing that. i noticed was that there are two desks in there one that said edith and one that said lewis but i didn't see a desk that said milton and that had me interested i wonder if the homeschooling started after milton disappeared he would that is quite possible. Well, that's it's also interesting though because Lewis and Edith were v quite a few years apart. Edith was born in 1999. Lewis was born in 1988, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. yeah, 11 years. Yeah, Milton so, was 92. Question so, about Milton: What happened? I, 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 that's the one that, that one went boom right over my head. I, I still don't get it. Uh, well, I don't obvious, think actually. you were supposed to. According I thought to you, it was very easy. Can, uh, one, I don't know why you guys are confused. It, one, he clearly created a portal to another dimension and <laughs> then left. <laughs> He's like, I, screw you, nerds. <laughs> one person in my chat stated it's a reference. This is somebody who I don't know who was just like watching because he's like, I've watched this game 12 times. I like watching streamers' reactions. I'm like, oh. um, but anyways, um, he, uh, this person in my chat mentioned that it's a reference to their previous game, which is Unfinished Swan. Um, if you never played Unfinished Swan, it was a PlayStation 4 question mark exclusive. Uh, play, it was a PlayStation exclusive. Um, I only play finished games, so I wouldn't play. <laughs> <laughs> As says the guy who played Planet Coaster Alpha. Moving on. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and RimWorld. Um, but anyways... Uh, the, un the unfinished swan essentially it's just a blank canvas um and you have ink and you throw basically like cans of ink onto the world and it makes stuff up here so uh according according to this viewer in my chat it was a reference to that but it still doesn't explain what happens to milton and as especially because i don't think any of us here own a playstation it anybody i mean i have a ps3 nope, but it's nope. a blu-ray player like I don't actually have a controller charged. <laughs> I haven't in a while. It's literally just a PC mysteries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, so Mil it, Milton's it, death scene is this flip book that you find on his uh, drawing board, and you flip through it, and it shows it's what's called the magic paintbrush. And yeah. Milton is painting this door, and then he goes through the door into I, another. I, I mean, presumably he made the flip book, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Presumably he ran away. It's. It's Sweet. actually interesting because a little bit before that, when you're in the cemetery, you have a tombstone for um, you have a tombstone for Milton, but it doesn't have a death date on it. And in fact, there's a little dialogue option when you click on it. It goes, um, you know, the mother insisted that this is a, this isn't a tombstone. It's a it's a uh, like memorial. I think it was. Yeah, they never found a body, or they never had a body to bury. So yeah, he, he must have just ran away. Well, so that's Milton, I think. Um, I mean, yeah. our, like he, we think he just ran away. Like, there's no evidence for anything, right? Like, it's, it's just he just literally vanished. No. vanished. I mean, they did like put him on the roof of a house. So. Well, he had such a cool observatory. He had a freaking me? lighthouse to live in, man. Yeah, that was cool. Oh yeah, no, like I... poke his head out, and see everything. Especially yeah. for someone who is interested in painting, you'd think that'd be nice. Yeah, well, you have the cool little pulley to get up there. You, you guys cool think? Do you guys think he had a lesson, or like, wh what do you think they're trying to say with him? Like, maybe another thing on active imagination, or getting lost in your passions, maybe. That could be it. Like he, like he, the the, the pain, the door being a metaphor for not like an actual door, or like maybe the door out the house, but more a metaphor for his art. Like mm -hmm. he he dove into got his consumed art. by his artwork, I guess. Yeah. I Maybe. mean, oh. but you you one one doesn't die from that, but <laughs> unless it's too much oil paint, then I guess you might. Okay, so next oh, is the longest sequence in the game, which I think we can probably cover relatively quickly, which is Lewis. Now, yep. so for the record, my name is Lewis, spelled the exact same way. 
That was Sorry. a bit freaky. My, my, my <laughs> name was Gregory. I drowned in a bathtub. So, anyways. Yeah. Lewis is a substance abusing gamer, I guess, for all intents and purposes. Um, he uh, doesn't want to do much until his mother basically forces him to work at a fish cannery. Canning. So essentially, his job is uh, he grabs the fish, Cook. pushes it across, chops the head off, pushes it forward. And this mini game for his story is real interesting because half of your controls are the fish, the other half mm -hmm. is his imagination, where he's essentially building a world in his mind. Um, and he's basically bored as heck at work and yeah. he's just trying to fill his. I used to his... do this. I, I've worked in yeah. assembly line work, um, and I've l had that exact situation. You know, when you're working eight hours a day doing the exact same thing, you're not allowed to talk to your coworkers, and you're 40 feet away from your nearest coworker, except for a fit, like two 15 minute coffee breaks and a lunch break. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's. Sorry, did you see the thing that. No, Harry... I'm looking. <laughs> Stop it, Harry. Bad Harry. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I'll keep. Okay, I'll for keep... the people watching the uh, vod, someone uh, you know watching the YouTube. I'm saving or that image right now. Uh, I'll, I'll put it. In someone the photoshopped blinds in my face onto the family tree in the game. I'll, I'll put. I'll put that uh, description of the video. Anyways, um, yeah. <laughs> so it, it essentially it's 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 his job, right? And because it's it's numb work, he managed like the, the game tells you that he manages to convince himself that his imagination is more real than the real world. It is worth saying though that when it starts off, like he gets the job at the cannery because his mother is concerned because he seems to be very depressive. Yeah. Right. And he's like, he doesn't seem to have that like I I think that people need a thing, right? You need to be able to do something and be able to take pride in it. And he didn't have that. And his mother saw him resorting to drugs to try to fill that gap. And so to help him, she got him a job at the cannery, which the there, the whole story is told through a psychiatrist's note. So I guess that plays into it because it's important that he seems to be suffering he, through yeah, something. Yeah, initially he's, he's it, the, the story is narrated about him talking to a psychologist and, um, them saying that oh well he had an active imagination so we promoted that at first and then eventually consumed him um but his job mm -hmm. his boss had said that he became a model uh employee like the best employee you could possibly ask for and it just mm -hmm. can, continues on and it's it's funny because initially like you see his entire job and then in the bottom corner is like um his imagination and then it just slowly spreads and eventually by the end of this almost like 20 minute long mini game um which by the way when it started i wasn't sure what it was at first like it just popped up on the screen and i'm like mm -hmm. what's supposed to be happening with this just still chopping the fish i'm like uh, what's, what's going on here buddy are you gonna what's move? interesting is how it progresses because it start out starts out as a very minimalistic like top down maze where the borders are all white walls black and, and white, then it yeah. starts gaining a little bit of color and you start walking through and then it becomes sort of an isometric game and then it starts actually gaining full 3D after the boat segment. It's, and it's, it's just quite beautiful. It's like World of Warcraft. Broader and broader to kind of. Uh, There's a point where it just him. suddenly looks like Diablo for a bit there. Yeah. Yeah. And so it just to yeah. sort of simulate him getting deeper and deeper into the story. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up was that, as Blind mentioned, you had a one stick control uh, your fishery, you cutting the fish, and the other one controlling you in the memory. Um, oh. And it anyone was who remembers. On the controller? What? It was backwards on the controller. Because on in the game, the fish is on the right and the game's taking place over on the left, but you indicated that the controls were backwards. I like, I may be backwards myself. Oh, okay. I'm, okay, point is it was uh -huh. one and the other. But mm -hmm. anyone who remembers uh the episode we did on Brothers of Tales Two Sons may remember I ragged on it using the two stick to control two different things. Um and so the thing about this game is I felt like it handled it a little bit better. And I think the reason is is that one of them was always very static in the memory you know in the uh, mental imagery you basically just hold a direction and the fish one really only demands your attention for a few seconds at a time so you can just hold in a direction do the fish thing and then go back to the you know imagination to figure out what you need to do so you never were trying to do two things at once it was just a matter 
of managing the two things one at a time. And yet I still found myself messing up with the fish. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't grab the fish. But <laughs> So who wants to talk about how this one ends? Sounds uh, like you do. Gruesomely. <laughs> so at the end, the at the end, you eventually your imagination takes over the whole screen. You can't see any of the cannery, but you just have this fish kind of flopping down on top of everything, and you have to still shove it over and cut it, and it just kind of fl flies off into nothingness. Yeah. They also do a cool thing with. Oh, sorry to interject, but they incorporate the fish beheading into his dream periodically. Like, so for example, he comes to like doors, and in order to open them, you have to like cut off the fish's head, and then it like cuts the barricade, and then you can go through. And yeah, so that I, I think that was a really good touch. But anyways, you end up walking down this hall, uh, and you uh, are coming up to the throne, and you can see that your your prince or prince or queen, whoever you ended up choosing, there's like a path that you can choose. Um, will put the crown on your head, and you have to like bow your head down to have the crown placed on it. But it's obviously a guillotine. Yeah, and you're so, bowing your head down in front of a guillotine. Yeah, and so then. The guillotine comes down, and um, I, I need to preface this before that. Um, before that part of the imagination starts happening, you stop doing the fish thing, and it cuts out to you walking, like I guess through the crew quarters of the yeah. of your workplace. You walk mm -hmm. onto the conveyor belt and walk into the fish grinder. And while you're walking it, once you walk into the fish grinder, it hops into the throne room where you walk up to the guillotine. And, and there's a whole bunch of bands and people cheering. And, and you put your head down, you they on. put the crown on your head, and it chops your head off. Yep. So, essentially, he walked into the meat grinder. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I, I agree with Blind in that. I think this was the most powerful in that this... I think part of it is because it's more close to us in time. Like, there... I, in his room, he's a, he has a video game system. He has like two monitors, for example, and like you can tell that he's very like technologically connected for the time. And, he's four years older than me for, as well. And yeah, like, like it, it's very relatable to us. Mm -hmm. And he's probably playing Doom and Quake, man. You know, <laughs> did like, you see that, the console that he had? Like on a tangent, like in in the room, it was like a Super Nintendo, but it had joysticks on it. And that was like the biggest television ever for the time. But you know. <laughs> Anyways, I thought that was funny. They must yeah, have like, a lot I of money. I can't identify with the substance abuse portions of what he was doing, but I think that it. And there's a lot felt, going on with that too. Like he has several pipes for weed laying around. He has this big hookah. It's there's like a little something next to the hookah that you're like, that's not tobacco, buddy. And um, he has like another. I thought I saw um, something that hinted to even a harder drug. So it's. He was having abusing. some substance abuse issues, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think this one just struck home. I, I, I agree with like, man. Uh, it's just because it's the most relatable for us specifically. I think anybody who plays this game will relate to something somewhere in this game. And yeah. I think that's just kind of what they did. Is they covered all the bases. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is so far our longest episode ever, so let's uh, make haste, yeah. I there's, think. There's yeah, one last... One last story to cover, which we should cover really quick because I am running out of time. But the very last one is you go up to Edith's room and you talk about the very last day. So like oh, for about a week after Lewis died, the mother had Edith and her pack everything up. And they Without didn't really tell grandma. Edie. Yeah. They didn't tell Edie until like the day before. And she then flashes back to the last day they spent in the house. Um there, there's actually a really nice thing where it starts with them at dinner and then Edie kind of says, you know, like a toast to our final dinner together and all the ones apart. And then it's like, you know, uh, Edith, you're excused. Uh, the grown-ups need to argue right now. And so Edith goes to the library and tries to read the story of Edie when she, on the day that, of Edith's birth. And I had this whole thing where she was walking out into the ocean because the tide had lowered so much that the, uh, the, ho the old house was still visible, so she tried to walk to it. And you get to the point where she opens up the gate, she starts walking up to the house, and Dawn, her mother, comes in and tries to rip the uh, book out of Edith's hands, and they end up tearing it apart. Yeah. And so Dawn and Edith get in the car, and they leave, and that's the last time they see Edie. Uh, it's sort of she, implied that she died that day just based on the tombstone, it's, but she did. 
it, they said that the caretakers for the nursing home that they had sent for the grandmother never found her and that yeah. there was no body so well it, it it was implied they just said all i saw was the word gone which could mean either way i have a okay feeling, you're right okay i have a feeling she tried to get to the other house yeah but uh, uh, that's my assumption there Oh, and um, it is worth knowing for the plot that Edith had been, or Dawn, Edith's mother, had been trying to keep the curse away from her children. Yes. So he was trying to hide that, all of her finding the book was a very big deal. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then the very, very end, um, you have that it, kind of birthing it, sequence. Which it, it, I, when I was when I was looking at, it, I was like, "Is this against Twitch's terms of services?" No. Like, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> has, okay, has anybody here seen Click? Uh, is yes. that the one Adam it's an Sandler Adam movie? Sandler movie where he fast forwards? He, he, re he rewinds all the way back in time and gets reborn. In one of the scenes. real talk, though, I loved that Adam Sandler movie. That was... I like that movie too, but I think that movie preemptively ruined that scene. Anyway, because yeah. <laughs> just like you basically yeah. Click snapped into my head. I was like. Uh, there, yeah, that that scene disgusted me. Actually, I was like, I, I was like, wait a minute, wait a am minute, I, am I is it am I inside? Is this the inside of a vagina? Is that what's happening <laughs> right now? Am I is that? God, damn it! Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, so like that whole scene, it's um like you're just floating through the birthing canal and it's like narrating everything. And uh, we never really mentioned this, but the narrator is often at times writing to a you. And once you learn that. Uh, she's pregnant, it makes a lot more sense because she's writing it for yeah. her kid. But it sounds like she knows she's going to die, which is a little bit strange. Well, what but happens actually at the I'm very presuming. end is at the very end, they clarify that because she's like, I hope you'll never have to read this. I wish I, I hope I can tell you these stories in person, but if you're reading this, then obviously that didn't happen. That makes sense. And so she wrote that kind of more as a contingency and she ended up dying, if not do, you know, directly during the dial, uh, childbirth at least shortly after yeah. Uh, yeah that kid was older though right like he was like eight yeah. or something by the time he comes around they so. they skip ahead yeah. several years they skip ahead several years well well technically you start as the boy you see him open up the book at the very beginning on the boat and then you cut to him closing the book in front of edith's grave makes sense oh i didn't get that i i almost forgot yeah. about the boat scene. i had to replay that yeah mm-hmm I should replay that too. Because I, I, you know, I had assumed that that was Edie on the boat. Or you got really Edith quiet all of a sudden, Doc. I did? Yeah. Maybe I moved away. Maybe, Maybe my mic was like, uh, you were too loud there, buddy. Maybe. I, my cat's come to say hi, so. Um, but yeah, no, um, the, the end of the game was like definitely a tearjerker. I don't know. Like, I guess it didn't leave me feeling sad, just more morose, like. I felt like yeah. I identified with a, shit. people in the family, and uh, I could relate to a lot of the different stories there. And that's kind of like my thoughts on the whole, the game as a whole. Very relatable, very well written, in my opinion. Very well planned out, very well executed. I I don't think there's anything missing from the game. Um, maybe just. I had a little bit more information about what happened to Edith would be nice, but I can understand why they didn't give it. What, what were you going to say, Doc? Uh, I found myself, like, the entire time since I started, like, playing it, since the boat scene, all the way to through to the very end, I had felt as though they had made the assumption that I was in love with this game and I wanted to play this game really badly. And there was no part where they were, like, actively making an effort to get me to like the story or anything. It was supposed to be, like, they, like, I, I kind of liked it at some points because I thought they were taking a very casual approach to it. And you're supposed to take it at your own pace and, like, take it as you wanted to take it. But I felt like that left, like, a weird kind of, like bit on the table where they're like this game's amazing isn't it and i'm just like i'm not there yet man i'm still playing it well calm down <laughs> and so i don't know if that was just me or what'd you think overall yeah i mean i enjoyed the game i thought um the vanishing of ethan carter did a slightly better job because while there's no point in that game where you're like oh my god i'm gonna die there was like this sense of like i, I wanted to get through the game i wanted to go quicker or and I wanted to learn like what was happening, but with this game, it felt like I was just I was on this journey, and I didn't really know why. 
but I was on it and for what it was, I enjoyed it. You know, it was a good story. It was a good journey, but like, it was just one of those things where it's like the entire time. I'm like, why though? <laughs> why? Yeah. Makes sense. And that's where the morals come in. Like each story being a specific lesson to teach kind of like as an after fact, it's like, oh, you know, that's clearly what they're going for. And so it's like a whole lesson thing. And that's it. like, it's a, it's a book basically. Why, me, do, why do people read books? I was you sold know, on like, this game when I read the concept. Like I, I, I saw a Steam page. I was like, oh, I know this dev. Cause they made Unfinished Swan, a game that I wanted to play but didn't play, and then just like looked at it and was like, "Oh shit, I need to play this game." Like it was like a yeah. month before the game came out. I saw the Steam page. I was like, "Yep, I need to play this game." And then uh, a couple days later, I was listening to the Co-optional podcast, and uh, Dodger got to play through like the first like twenty minutes or something at an event. And I was just like, "So the first half, <laughs> the the, fir the first the first the first death, I think I think up to Molly," um, and I'm just like. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely need to play this game. Just after her description, it's like, yep, I need to play it. So, yeah, well, I, I did really enjoy the game. I felt like it was varied enough to stay interesting while keeping a good overarching story to keep everything connected. I feel like so, it didn't outstay its welcome, which is yeah, definitely really hard to do in this type of game. So yeah, Eggman, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, I kind of already went over them. Uh. I felt like I had a rapport with the family after finishing it, which I think is a really good sign of character development or char characterization of these people. Um, it, I, I didn't have the same thoughts as Doc, but I appreciate that you kind of voiced them, that I went into it expecting good things, um, which is maybe a mistake on my part, but I don't feel that it necessarily clouded my judgment in the game because I'll try to take a game for what it is. Um, and I, I did think it was a very good game. And uh, I just, I want to take a moment to highlight possibly one of the best credit sequences I've ever seen. How so? What do you mean? It was baby pictures of the developers. Oh. That is okay. awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that is awesome. It's just okay, all the baby we pictures. We should wrap up because I say, I think Lois needs to head yeah. out here. So, yeah. um, I, I, I think that that was our longest episode of all time. Uh, yeah, easily. Like we an had an hour and a half one, but that was, I think, was longer. Like still. That was like an hour and 45 minutes. I don't know. I'm cut down the middle, so I'm going to have to like splice the two pieces together, but it'll be fine. Um, in, in short, uh, to anybody who watched live, uh, if you uh, missed the whole show, um, you can catch it later on my YouTube channel. Hopefully, it'll be up within 48 hours. Same with the audio version on SoundCloud. You can find us on Twitter at Real Story Mode, which is down below Doc's face. And. Um, you can find previous episodes of the show on my YouTube channel and on our SoundCloud. Uh, we also have a Steam curator, uh, which has like a full list of all the games that we've covered. Uh, real quick, Doc, just shout yourself out before we head out. Who's our guest um, host for today? I, I am on Twitch. You can find me at twitch.tv slash Dr. K Puffy, D O C T O R K P U F F Y. And uh, Lewis and Eggman, do you guys have anything you guys want to talk about before we head out? shout out personally or anything that you're doing anything you're planning to do I, I guess i'll start um i say this every month so i'll say it again i hope to start streaming again soon so when i finally do you can find me twitch.tv slash lrflew you know name below me um <laughs> i plan on doing some things like trying to speed run minute club 2 and maybe learn like psychonaut speed runs and maybe some game dev stuff who knows we'll see Breaking some world records over there. Um, yep, I, uh, I'm the Eggman. I'm on Twitch and also on everything is the Eggman. So come find me. Come talk to me in Blind's chat. Say hi. Thanks. He likes Caravan Palace, and uh, I mean, who doesn't though? Yeah, true. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Blind IRL. This is my Twitch channel. If you found the show, this is my show. We've been running it for over a year now, which is weird. We run it once a month on the second Sunday of every single month. And uh, we all need to go. I, I have to be somewhere in 30 minutes. Lewis needs to be somewhere. And I think everybody needs to go. So uh, we're going to call it. It is Mother's Day. It is Mother's yeah. Day. That wasn't very well planned. Be sure to say hi. To, say they, Tell your mothers that you love them because they could die a gruesome death any moment. <laughs> Thank you, Edith Finch. Yeah. And that giant, was Edie's story. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Giant Sparrow Games, thanks for making a very interesting game for us to talk about today. And... Uh, we will see more from them in the future. Thank you very much for watching, everybody, and good night, morning, afternoon. Peace. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.